It's another edition of Time About the Movies, and today we're taking a look at the six films of August 12, 2005. And uh, we have some notable movies here. We have John Singleton directing Mark Wahlberg, Tyrese Gibson, Andre Benjamin, and Garrett Hedlund as four brothers. We also have, now I completely forgot the list, but um, Kate Hudson, we have her in a new psychological thriller. The sequel that everybody was asking for, the movie that they literally sold as the movie that was going to be the next Austin Powers 2 or Meet the Fockers. And, um, nope, not with Rob Schneider involved in it, that's for damn sure. Uh, we have the war drama, The Great Raid. We also have um, a movie where this guy lives with the bears for 13 years, and or at least 13 years, and one of the bears ends up killing him in the long run. Um, we'll take a look at that movie, and we'll also take a look at Pretty Persuasion. So, a lot of movies to get to here. I'm already wasting so much of your time right now introducing you to the show. Let's just go ahead and jump on that into it. Let's go ahead and start with the, the, honestly, the best new movie that came out this weekend, and that is Mark Wahlberg, Tyrese Gibson, Andre Benjamin, and Garrett Hedlund, as for brothers. Sort of like a modern version of the classic John Wayne movie, The Sons of Katie Elder, where you have four adopted brothers who come to avenge their mother's death in what appears to be a random killing at a grocery store robbery. However, the boys' investigation of the death reveals more nefarious activities, including the one brother's business dealings with the notorious local hoodlum. Two cops who are trying to solve the case may also not be what they seem either. This is John Singleton. This was his last really good movie before his unfortunate passing because the next film he'd make after this was Abduction, which was a terrible movie starring Taylor Lautner. But, you know, John Singleton himself had described this movie as being black exploitation influence, which, I mean, I could kind of see it in there. This is the guy that also did the Shaft remake in 2000, which was a pretty good movie, too. But I see more of it as kind of a modern telling of, like I said, The Sons of Katie Elder, which I think was the point of it. I think it was supposed to be a modernized version of it. But, um... A really, really good movie. Mark Wahlberg is very good in the movie. So is, Ty uh, so is the uh, Tyrese Gibson, Andre Benjamin, Garrett Hedlund. You really do believe that they are family, even though they clearly come from two different. They clearly come from two different mindset, two different families in general. But they come together because of the situation, because of the situation that the mother in here that they're that are trying to revenge gets involved in. Um, just a really, really good movie. A lot of engaging moments in there. A lot of good tension that keeps you on the edge of your seat. It's a really, really good movie that plays to John Singleton's strengths as a director. And these actors' strengths as good actors. I mean, they really do sell the film. And they just make the film work on so many different levels. It's a movie that is really engaging, really intense. You really don't know what direction it's really going to go to. I love the fact that it plays with your plays with your expectations. That's what a good movie like this should be doing. You want to know the mystery, like why this random person, why her. There has to be some kind of connection to it, and you find out as the course of the film goes, there is a connection to it, and it just keeps building and building to this moment where you expect the big payoff to work out, and it works off very well here. It's a really damn good movie. One that I don't think gets the proper respect it deserves. It's honestly one of my favorite Mark Wahlberg movies, really. I think he really does give it his all in this movie. Everybody here really gives it all. all. You know, you got Terrence Howard, Josh Charles, uh, Chiwetel Ejiofor, uh, Sofia Vergara is also in here, too. You know, back before, nobody really knew what to do with her at first because she was only always in these different TV shows that never really went anywhere. Only a couple years later, they show up in Modern Family where they finally find someone for her, and she actually w works in there. She shows up here for a little bit. She's pretty good, too. Everybody in here plays their parts very well. I love the atmosphere of the winter. Of winter, like I, I, Winter's my favorite season, so anytime I see a movie like this when it's hot outside in the summertime, I saw this in a theater back, in the, back when this came out, and when I see the winter feel on the big screen, it's just... It's kind of hard not to be taken aback by that. Just like, I just love the idea. I just love how winter kind of plays a role in this movie. But, and you don't really notice it until later on down, until you really, really watch it again. But um, it's a really good film. It's a really good damn movie. Can't say any more about it. It hasn't already been said. Definitely seek it out for brothers. So uh, let's go ahead and move on to our next movie. And that is Kate Hudson in the psychological horror thriller, The Skeleton Key. I mean, just wow, Universal. You had the balls to come on and say, this is the next great psychological horror movie. It's going to be in the same vein as Rosemary's Baby, The Others, The Sixth Sense. And, um, yeah, spoiler alert, no it isn't. In fact, it's not even anywhere near as close to as good as those movies are. Um, in this movie, you have a New Orleans hospice nurse played by Kate Hudson who begins a job at a, at a Terrebonne Parish plantation home and becomes engaged in a mystery involving the house, its former inhabitants, and who do, do rituals that took place there. 
and it's about as generic of a, of a psychological horror movie as you can get. This is directed by, uh, uh, this is written by, I should say, written by Aaron Kruger, who gave us The Ring. Who, and, uh, you know, he was seen as a hot commodity at the time. Like, he was seen as a direct, a guy that was really going to go places. And there was a lot of movies he made that were supposed to be the next big thing for him and just never really went anywhere. It's another one of those movies that tries to get you on just the lackluster storyline and a twist that you think you... And it's, it, it, Again, that trailer had the balls to tell you. A twist ending you'll never see coming. I saw it coming within 20 minutes. I knew exactly where they were going when they, when they, when they, when they, when they were setting it up. It's just kind of like... Like, really? Like, you... Re this movie really had the... This Universal really had the balls to say that this movie was going to subvert everyone's expectations. Gee, I would really believe it if this movie wasn't released in the dumping month of August. I mean, that should pretty much tell you everything that you need to know about this movie. That they dumped this in the middle of August thinking that they were going to surprise people with this movie that was actually good, a, a tense throw wide, and it's anything but that. Like, Kate Hudson does not deserve, does not really des deserve to be in a movie like this. This should have gone to somebody else besides her. Like, she's known for a romantic comedy. She's known for much more dr comedic, dramatic roles. Like, stuff not, like, almost famous. But, like, here... There's no reason for her to be in this movie whatsoever. This is just a waste of good talent. Jenna Rollins, John Hurt, Peter Skarsgård, Joy Bryant. Good talent wasted in this. Just a really bad movie in general. Yeah, avoid this one like the plague. And speaking of movies that you should avoid like the plague, um, I don't think I need to explain this one more, this one to you more, but um, just keep in mind that when this movie was coming out, they were projecting this to be the next big comedy sequel hit. Like, this was going to be the next Austin Powers 2 or Meet the Fockers, where it was just going to surpass everyone's expectations because the first movie had such a loyal fan fan base that it was the, they have, this movie had no choice but to succeed. And what movie is it? What sequel were they hyping up so much that it could not possibly fail in any way, shape, or form? Really? This was the movie you were hyping up as the next Austin Powers 2 or Meet the Fockers. This movie? This movie. And you think I'm kidding around here. I'm not. I shit you not. They were promoting this like this was going to be the next big move. The next big move comedy sequel success. I wish I could find the footage, the episode, the uh, news report that came out. It was like a show on, um, I can't remember what it was. I think it was either MSNBC or E! where, like, they interviewed Rob Schneider and the interviewer said, you know, this movie is amazing. This movie is gonna break box office records. It's gonna be the next Meet the Fockers. It's gonna be the next, you know, Austin Powers 2. They were literally boosting this guy's ego, think thinking that he had the next big comedy hit. And, um, and even when the weekend box office predictions came out, when this movie was coming out, they were projecting $22, 30000000 million opening weekend. But, like, like this movie? First of all, Deuce Bigelow Male Jiggle does not have the same fan base that Austin Powers or Meet the Parents did. It doesn't even have the same fan base that the Naked Gun movies did when they became more successful than the previous is that when those sequels became suc more successful than the first movie did. Like, this... It's amazing how this movie just completely... Just completely just fooled everybody into thinking it was going to be a success. I also like the story that Disney rejected the sequel as inappropriate because they wanted to make the film PG-13. So, think about that. Disney almost made them do a PG-13 sequel to this. But... The orphan. They took the sequel to Sony, and Disney actually retained five percent of the box office closes, which really isn't saying a whole lot compared, considering that this made twenty-two million dollars. So, how much would that be, really? How much was five percent of twenty-two million dollars? Okay, I think I got it right here. One point one million dollars. So, woohoo! Disney made a million dollars, which is probably what they make in a day at their theme parks. Was it really worth it? And Sony also had a, held a. I should you not, a Man Whore of the Year Award contest with Maxim Magazine in Las Vegas. They really tried to make you believe that this was going to be the next big thing. And, um, yeah, it, it wasn't. As I said before, this thing got even worse reviews than the first movie did, earned less money than its predecessor did. It barely made back half of its budget. $22 million in the, in the U.S. alone. I mean, okay, technically, it did make, it did make, 
a little bit more than the budget did, but even then, they were expecting much more from this, and I guess I should talk about the film itself, because I really have not done yet, yet, but, um, like, you really need to know what the plot of this is. Uh, the plot involves male prostitute Deuce Bigelow visiting his former pimp TJ in Amsterdam, and looking for a murderer who is killing the greatest man whores of Europe, and, um, you see the trailer there, and you see the exact reason why this movie is a complete colossal failure. Because, once again, how the hell does this guy always, always keep getting these ugly-looking pe people, all these people with different problems, when the regular gigolos in the world get these hot-looking women? Like, 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 I don't get it. Like, how the hell do you even... It's how the hell do you even do that? Like, does, does Rob Schneider have this thing where, like, if he even tries to get a date with somebody, they just automatically turn into the ugliest person in the world? Like, nothing about this makes any sense whatsoever. Like, this whole movie makes no sense at all. The jokes are lazy. You see them in the trailer there. It's, it's like, hey, the woman's got a, the woman's got a, a circle on her neck. Well, an opening in her neck because of, because we don't because not because she has any problems or anything but because we want to make a joke whenever she drinks something let's have him spit wine all over Rob Schneider and let's have a woman whose nose is literally a penis when they sneeze they sneeze out what looks like cum that's a joke ladies and gentlemen like this movie is abysmal it's absolutely horrible it is amazing that this is not hot up high up there with one of the worst movies that I've ever seen in my life. But it's a movie that I just had to look at this and go like, did you really put a lot all this effort into this? This whole there was really that much of a clamoring for a movie like this. But then again, this is Happy Madison, the company that said we're gonna make another Paul Blart movie six years after the last movie, even though nobody gives a shit about the first movie anymore, and it's gonna make even less money than the second movie than the first movie did. They literally did the same thing to Paul Blart Mall Cop, but at least Paul Blart Mall Cop was trying. They were trying to be funny. They were trying to have something there, but. This and Deuce Bigelow 2 just fall in the same category that I talk about so many times on this show. Comedy sequels that come way too long after the previous movie. Unless, you have, unless you're putting it out within two to three years, you shouldn't even be bothering making a sequel. But because they waited all this time, because clearly Rob Schneider has so many busy projects that he has to work on. No, this, this we had to make this movie. And this is just an abysmal, abysmal movie. This is a terrible film. Just such a such a waste of such a waste of time, such a waste of effort, such a waste of comedy, such a waste of everything. This is an absolutely horrible movie. But really, I don't really need to tell you that because honestly, the movie speaks for itself on how bad it really is. Like I uh, I really want to find the one person out there that isn't some crazy nut job that thinks this is actually a good movie because I'd slap the hell out of them. I would honestly slap the hell out of them if you, it's just like like you, like. Really? This movie? This movie? Like, I don't know. That's about six minutes of me rambling about how bad this movie is, because it is a bad movie. So, let's let's try to turn the tide again. Let's go ahead and move back into the positive side of things by taking a look at the next movie we have here, and that is The Great Raid. Well, it's not a good movie, but it certainly beats the crap out of Deuce Bigelow, European Gigolo. That's for damn sure. But, um, The Great Ray. This is a war film about the raid at Cabana Tuin. I think I'm pronouncing that right. On the island of Luzon, Philippines, during World War II. And it showcases the effort of American soldiers and the Filipino resistance guerrilla rescuing allied pr prisoners of war from a Japanese POW camp. The cast that includes Benjamin Bratt, James Franco, Kylie Nielsen, Martin Skakis, uh, Joseph Fiennes, um, directed by John Dahl, uh, this was a film that, um, yeah, this is a film that they originally shot three years ago in 2002, and, um, it's coming out in 2005. If that is not an indication of how good this movie, how, how this movie should be received, I don't think anything ever will. This is a pretty bad movie, but it's trying. It's not that it's a bad, it's not that it's really a bad film, it's just kind of a generic war film, honestly. Like, I really went into this expecting a little bit more, but this is about as generic of a war film as you get. There's really nothing about it that makes it stand out or anything that gives it a unique edge to it, like something like a 1917 does, or even later in the year, while we'll Jarhead. But this... This is about as lazy of a movie as you can get. It's a film that is just so bland. 
Like, it's just not even trying. It's just trying to do what most war films do and not even the good war films. It's a waste of money. It's a waste of a lot of talent. This thing cost $80 million to make. It didn't even make a tenth of what the, this movie brought, this movie cost to make. Like, that should tell you everything you, you need to know about how this this movie performed. It's just... It's just such a mess of a movie. Not a great film by any means necessary, but again, looking at Deuce Piccolo, European Gigolo, it's a masterpiece compared to that, but that's not really saying a whole lot either. But um, So anyway, let's go ahead and get to, back to some good movies now. Let's go ahead and take a look at one of Herzog's Grizzly Man. White people. White people, white people, white people. This is something that clearly a white person would do. Any other person of race or color tries to do this. First thing, first thing they do as soon as they get out there is just like, oh hell no, and just goes back to civilization. But this is Grizzly Man. This is a documentary directed by Werner Herzog, chronicling the life and death of bear enthusiast and, cons and conservationist Timothy Treadwell and his girlfriend Amy is Amy Hugengard at Katmai at Katmai National Park in Alaska. It includes some of Treadwell's own footage of his interaction with the brown bears before 2003, and of interviews with people with who, who he knew or were involved with Treadwell, in addition to professionals who deal with wild bears. The two both from New York bonded over their common passion for bears and animal conservation. Uh, she would occasionally accompany him on trips to the park, having stayed past the summer season one year. The pair were attacked and killed in the park by a bear on October 5, 2003. The couple's remains were discovered by a patrolling pilot, and an audio recording of the attack was found among the remains, and the bear was later encountered and killed by the pilot's rescue team. And then they didn't realize it, that he smoked a bunch of cocaine and started killing and started killing people, and the bear started killing them. Now, that would have been a much more engaging move. This was actually the prequel to Cocaine Bear, but... No, not the case whatsoever. But this is a really, really good movie. A very intense, very terrifying movie about this guy who spends all these years with these bears, and he and he thinks that he's he, he's invulnerable to getting is to getting attacked by them because of him living amongst them. But you know, these are wild animals, and of course, at some point, they're gonna say, you know what, we're tired of this. We're we're hungry. We're coming after your ass. It's like it's like um that movie Roar with the director actually having all these different tigers and lions in this place and thinking that they're all family. They're all, there's no problem with this whatsoever. You know, this is, everyone's going to be fine. Then you hear all the stories about the behind the scenes drama with people literally getting their throats ripped out by them. Like that's a movie on its own levels of insanity that we'll eventually get to when it finally gets an official release in 2015. But this, yeah, this is a pretty messed up movie and a fun and a, an engaging film too. Like, like, it's really, like, you're watching these moments with this guy, and it's just like, I would never be in one of these situations whatsoever. Like, if I, like, I've, like, these, like, he's right in the middle with all these wild animals. He thinks that he's harmless. Like, he thinks he's God, like, he thinks he's God to these bears, pretty much. And, like, he has a superiority over them. And then, of course, karma pays him back big time in the end. And, uh, yeah, it gets, it's an intense movie. It's like the equivalent of watching Open Water from the year before. It's a very intense movie. Except in that movie, you were, except in that movie, the big difference is that the main characters are in a situation that wasn't really completely their fault. Here, this guy is pretty much just asking for it, and yeah, it's it gets very intense, it gets very terrifying, and yeah, you can expect what you expect to happen at the end, and yeah, it delivers on that front. So, yeah, a really good movie though. I do recommend it. When a Herzog's Grizzly Man. So, with that said, on to the last movie we have here, which is Pretty Persuasion. So if you ever wanted to see a movie where Dolores Abernathy gives Jenna Maroney a oral sex, uh, here you go. Here's that movie in general. Uh, this is Pretty Persuasion, and uh, as you can tell from the from the trailer there, this is a black comedy, and um, not the best one overall, but at least there's something about it that actually does make it kind of engaging to watch. You have a manipulative, sociopathic 15-year-old student played by Emma Rachel Wood, who's at an elite Beverly Hills Academy who accuses her drama teacher of sexual harassment. James Woods, Ron Livingston, Elizabeth Har Harness, uh, like I said, Jane Krakowski, a cast that also includes uh, Selma Blair is also in here as well, Jamie King, uh, Octavia Spencer has a role in here, a lot of talent in general, a fun concept overall in what they're trying to do. It's a daring, it's a bold movie that really does show that they're trying to do something unique and different and uh, something that would be completely, a movie that doesn't, that is willing to take some chances here, but 
it doesn't know the type of... It's one of those movies where the tonal shift really hurts it in the long run. Like, it's got a good idea of what kind of satire it wants to do. It just doesn't have the right script to really push it to the next level. Like, you, if you're going to go... All, if you're gonna go all in, just go all in. Like this is an independent movie. You you should have the free range to do whatever the hell you want to a movie like this. And it's just like, just go all in. Just go all in. Don't say you're gonna go all in and then just not do anything a after that. Just don't do. Don't be like Jerry Jones and say you're gonna go all in. And then you just and then all you do you're all in method is signing Ezekiel Elliott and Dalvin Cook and you get blasted and embarrassed by the New Orleans Saints. But um, that's a whole other story altogether. And this movie could have been that. It could have been something so engaging and so intense and so just dark and insane, like something along the lines of War of the Roses, but it just doesn't go that route, and it just sticks the landing. It doesn't stick the landing at all. It's just like, you were almost there. You were this close to really creating a fun, dark, black comedy, and you just decide to go to just stop right, stop it right in the middle of, the, of your routine and just say that you can't do it anymore. It's just like, Dude, finish what you were going to accomplish. Like, it's a shame because the casting in here is very good. You've got a lot of good talent in here, a lot of good ideas in general, but just the film itself, just the tonal shift is just all over the place. It just doesn't work as a whole. It doesn't stick the landing. It takes a wasted opportunity. Pretty persuasion. And so with that said, we wrap up another edition of Time About the Movies. The next time we meet, we'll take a look at four more movies, including uh, Judd Apatow's feature directorial debut, and the film that launched Steve Carell into the stratosphere as a, as a leading actor, The 40-Year-Old Virgin. We have Rachel McAdams and Killian Murphy in Wes Craven's psychological thriller, Red Eye. We have Disney with a, a CG animated movie that really isn't really one of theirs, but they put it out. Valiant, second animated feature with Ewan McGregor this year. And we also have Supercross, which I guess was supposed to be this year's Grind, which I don't know why that is, but we have that to look at. So four films in general to take a look at on the next episode. That'll be tomorrow. But until then... Thank you so much for watching, and if you want to see more videos like this, please hit the playlist on the next page, check out the previous episode, and please hit the like, subscribe, and notification button. We're less than six people away from 4,000 subscribers, and, um, you know, uh, we're almost there. We're almost there. Like I said in the intro, we're getting that close. We are really literally this close. Like, it's literally that many people. Six people, and then that intro can go away, and then I won't have to bother you again until I need your help to get me to 5,000 subscribers. But, um... Please, if you do like these videos, hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, hit the notification button. So uh, with all that said, I am off. I will see you guys next time, and until then, as always, take care.